Hi, I'm Frank Steinfield, Interim CEO of the Brookline Community Foundation. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to Building a Better Brookline, Housing Affordability in the Age of COVID-19. First, a couple of notes. This session is being recorded and will be available on the big website. And second, please post any questions on the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen. The speakers will address them after the upcoming panel discussion. This is the first of three forums organized by the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Relations, the Housing Advisory Board, and the Economic Development Advisory Board. So right off the bat, you can see that this is an effort to bring together multiple perspectives. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the core organizers, Joan Lancourt, Jonathan Klein, Paul Sainer, and Jenny Raitt. I'd also like to thank Kathy Bisbee, Ann Tice, and the whole big team for enabling us to go virtual. Today's forum, Changing the Conversation, will begin with Bob Van Meter offering remarks on the history of housing discrimination, and that will be followed by a panel discussion of multiple components of housing affordability. I'm here representing BCF, the only foundation focused on Brookline as a whole. We bring neighbors together to solve shared challenges, provide grants that expand opportunity and address urgent needs, and channel the resources of many toward building a more just and vibrant Brookline for all, which is a goal shared by everyone here today. Most recently, BCF has been focused on the safety net, which provides emergency assistance for community members in financial need, and currently it's providing relief during the COVID crisis. We've been operating this service for over 15 years in partnership with the Brookline Center, which provides expert case management. And the greatest expense by far is housing assistance, which is mostly rentals. And during the pandemic, demand for support has grown four to six times what we usually see due to all the economic dislocation, particularly in the service industry. The surge in demand reflects the precarious nature of housing in Brookline and elsewhere where missing one paycheck might put your family's housing at risk. I'm excited to be a part of this group of real experts to better understand the additional challenges brought on by the COVID crisis on top of the longstanding challenge of housing affordability, which has really illuminated the value of a home as a safe space and locus of public health. These challenges include a long history of unequal access and displacement due to redlining and discrimination. In addition, we're interested at looking at the spectrum of needs across Brookline, including the so-called missing middle options that are well suited to walkable transit-oriented communities like ours, and that would enable a wider range of access to stable housing for both low and moderate income people. The panel assembled today represents some of the key factors that contribute to housing affordability, including diversity and inclusion, transportation, economic development, and climate sustainability, all of which reflect the values of a community and largely define the experience of living there. In working with the Building a Better Brookline team, I've been struck by the vast potential for improvement and by the opportunity to channel the incredible resources that exist in this town to drive much needed change. But first we need to agree on what's important. What do we want to become? What do we not want to lose? Before moving on to our panel that will address some of these issues, I'd like to introduce Bob Van Meter, who comes to us from the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action, also known as JALSA. Bob has served as executive director for the Boston LISC program, as well as the, eight, as well as the ED of the Alston Brighton Community Development Corporation, a neighborhood-based developer of affordable housing. And he has served on multiple community development boards as well. You can read more extensive bios of all of today's participants up on our website, buildingabetterbrookline.org. Bob brings a wealth of experience in housing development and policy, and we're really glad he's here to start us off. Over to you, Bob. Thank you, Frank, and thanks to all the sponsors for making this conversation possible. For two years, I've been working with the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action to create a curriculum covering the history of racialized housing discrimination and segregation inspired by the recent book, The Color of Law, The Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. As we will discuss this afternoon, ending housing segregation will be critical to creating a more just America. We live in a divided and unequal region and many of the things we place value on are distributed based on where we live. Could you show the first slide, please? 
The map you see now on the screen illustrates that. It is a map of opportunity in Greater Boston developed by the Kerwin Institute. When we look at this map, we are looking at the real and ongoing consequences of racial segregation. That's the wrong slide, sorry. That's slide three. Um, uh, there we go, thank you. The real and ongoing consequences of racial segregation for African-American communities who continue suffering from the legacy of decades of inequity. Where we live determines our health and life expectancy, as well as our access to good schools, jobs, and transportation. It determines whether and how we can build wealth by buying a home that will increase in value. We often hear that your zip code should not determine your future, but we know it does just that. While there are differences in income and educational attainment between racial and ethnic groups, the starkest disparities are between groups are in wealth, the financial assets of a person or household. For most middle-class Americans, their home is the greatest asset that they own, and as such, it plays a significant role in determining their wealth. According to a 2015 study by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston titled The Color of Wealth, the median wealth of white households in Greater Boston was $256,000 while the median income of African-American households was only $700. That is correct, less than $1,000 per household. Today, I'd like to talk with you about the history behind these disparities, the policies, institutions, and decisions that created our divided and unequal America. Richard Rothstein writes in The Color of Law, our system of, of official segregation was not the result of a single law that consigned African-Americans to designated neighborhoods. Rather, scores of racially explicit laws, regulations, and government practices combined to create a nationwide system of urban ghettos surrounded by white suburbs. Private discrimination played a role, but it would have been considerably less effective had it not been embraced and reinforced by government. To better understand this history, we need to start with Jim Crow. Jim Crow was the system of laws and practices erected following the Civil War explicitly to enforce the continued oppression of formerly enslaved African-American people. While originating in the South with African-Americans initially experiencing relative integration elsewhere, Jim Crow crept northward beginning in the 1890s as whites sought to ensure that African-Americans remain disenfranchised and segregated. One critical way this occurred is through zoning regulations. Zoning is the system of land use regulations that most American cities and towns use to define what kind of building or use can be put on a plot of land. Prior to 1910, few localities had zoning regulations, but in the four decades that followed, their use grew dramatically as zoning became a tool of racial segregation. In fact, early zoning laws explicitly forbade African-Americans from living in certain districts of cities. While a 1917 Supreme Court decision banned this practice, zoning laws continued to be used to enforce racial, racial segregation, though the mechanism was no longer explicitly racial. In 1921, the National Advisory Committee on Zoning, led by then United States Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, published a national manual on model zoning laws. This committee was dominated by known segregationists, including Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., whose office was in Brookline for most of his life. Olmsted was not shy about his views on race, saying, in any housing developments which are to succeed, racial divisions have to be taken into account. If you try to force the mingling of people who are not ready to mingle and don't want to mingle, a development cannot succeed economically. As an example of how zoning continued to be racialized, African-American neighborhoods were often zoned for uses that white neighborhoods never were, including manufacturing and hazardous waste. The impact of this environmental racism is still felt through disparate health income outcomes driven in part by exposure to toxic air, soil, and water. The value of homes in these communities was also negatively affected by proximity to industrial sites, contributing to the racial wealth gap. Zoning exclusions of multifamily developments were also associated from the very beginning with racial segregation. In a 1926 decision, the Supreme Court, historically very favorable to private property rights, declared that multifamily housing, quote, comes very near to be a nuisance. A lower court judge in the same case explained that 
the blighting of property values and the congesting of the population whenever the colored or certain foreign races invade a residential section are so well known as to be within judicial cognizance. Indeed, in 1929, the nation's leading exper expert on administrative law, Columbia Law School professor Ernest Freund observed, the coming of the colored people into a district was a more powerful reason for the spread of zoning in the past decade than the creation of single family districts, the stated just justification for zoning. Segregationists also sought other ways to enforce racial separ separation. Racially restrictive covenants were widely used from the 1920s through the 1940s. Racial covenants were private contracts that were enforceable in court as binding upon the parties that signed them. They typically included language like the following. Hereafter, no part of said property or any portion thereof shall be occupied by any person not of the Caucasian race. It being intended hereby to restrict the use of said property against occupancy as owners or tenants of any portion of said property for residents of or other purposes by people of the Negro or Mongolian race. Importantly, cities actively promoted the adoption of these covenants. One of the first documented cases of restrictive covenants occurred in Brookline at Linden Place, first developed in 1843, one of the first suburban developments in the United States. Some community associations required each homeowner to include a racially restrictive covenant. In some cases where white home sellers sold African-American buyers, the result was legal action to force the new homeowner out. Racial covenants continued to be used for many years in Massachusetts and, ar and around the country until a 1948 Supreme Court decision made such deeds unenforceable. The covenants are still in the property records for many homes. There are many examples across the country of violence by neighbors against African-American families that sought to buy homes in violation of these restrictive covenants. Often the private violence was tolerated and abetted by local authorities. Turning now to federal housing programs, a defining point in the history of racial segregation came in the 1930s with the New Deal. This was the first time that the United States developed national housing policies and programs. While we often associate the New Deal with social security, public works on a grand scale and protection for workers, the political dynamics of that era meant that it also enshrined housing segregation in government policy. Modern American housing policy has its origins in the New Deal, including the 30-year fixed rate mortgage and many other innovations that still define America's housing. Unfortunately, the passage of legislation through Congress to create these programs required the support of the Southern segregationist members of Congress that were a critical part of the Democratic Party at the time. The result of this, as well as of racial attitudes prevalent in the North, was that many New Deal programs, although economically progressive, allowed and promoted racial discrimination. The National Housing Act of 1934 enabled the creation of a national system of public housing, but that system was designed to be segregated from the beginning. In fact, in many cases, it produced segregation in places that were previously integrated. In 1935, the Cambridge, Massachusetts Housing Authority demolished housing in an integrated neighborhood to build an all-white public housing development, Newtown Court. Five years later, it built an adjoining all African-American development, Washington Elms. However, the most far-reaching New Deal housing innovation was federal mortgage insurance. The Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration were created to insure mortgages and help to rebuild the housing market in the wake of the 1929 crash. The HOLC created mandatory underwriting guidelines for the banks that made mortgage up loans. However, these underwriting guidelines required that neighborhoods be racially homogenous and white in order to be eligible for federal insurance. Next slide, the redlining map, please. For each city, the Homeowners Loan Corporation developed maps showing which neighborhood were eligible for federal insurance. These maps graded neighborhoods with African American as fourth grade or hazardous, making them ineligible this practice became known as redlining. You can see Brookline on this map and a small section of Brookline adjoining uh, Boston in red. And you can see on the legend uh, to the right of the slide, um, descriptions of each grade of housing. This is what redlining was. FHA practices were also segregationist. A 1935 FHA underwriting manual stated that 
If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. One result of redlining was for some African American home buyers, since they could not obtain insured mortgages, they were offered contract sales, which did not offer the protection of a traditional mortgage. The contract buyer had no equity in the home until it was fully paid off. Hence, hence any arrearage could immediately cause a family to lose their home and any equity they had, preventing wealth accumulation. Following World War II, the Veterans Administration extended the work be begun by the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the FHA. In addition to individual homes, VA programs included the development of large-scale racially exclusionary communities like Levittown, New York. The development of these large-scale projects moved racial exclusion to actively promoting the creation of new segregated neighborhoods. New Deal legislation and VA initiatives supplied opportunities for home ownership and asset building that were critical in building America's middle class, but it was a lost opportunity for African Americans. Violence, redlining, and restrictive covenants all limited where African Americans could buy and limited their ability to build intergenerational wealth. As Melvin Oliver and Thomas Shapiro observed in their book, Black Wealth, White Wealth, the FHA's activities had a lasting impact on the wealth portfolio of Black Americans. Locked out of the greatest mass-based opportunity for wealth accumulation in American history, African Americans who desired and were able to afford homeownership found themselves consigned to central city communities where their investments were affected by the self-fulfilling prophecies of FHA appraisers. Even with the 1968 passage of the Fair Housing Act, African Americans continued to face discrimination in the home purchase and rental market. Enforcement of anti-discrimination laws is diffi difficult and usually occurs only when testing, where both white and non-white individuals present themselves to a realtor pretending they want to purchase a red home, is conducted by a fair housing advocates or government agency. This testing is expensive and does not occur very often. Having discussed the history of racial segregation, I now want to talk about the barriers that continue to perpetuate segregation in our region. Perhaps the most important is what has been called the paper wall of zoning, which refers to the widespread restrictions on multifamily housing in high opportunity communities. A recent study by that name by researcher Amy Dane explored the realities in greater Boston, finding that all all municipalities highly restricted multifamily development compared to demand. Consequently, little land is zoned for multifamily housing, and what is zoned is often built out to the allowed capacity. Municipalities also highly restrict the density of new multifamily developments, adopting dimensional standards about height, setbacks, parcel size that further limit the potential for build out. This is particularly troubling because earlier research, including some which was included in the 2019 Greater Boston Housing Report Card has showed an association between levels of racial integration and if a community provides zoning for multifamily housing. This limited supply of affordable multifamily housing in quote high opportunity communities means that renters, which disproportionately includes people of color, have few opportunities to live in those high opportunity places. 2016 research from the Boston Globe and Brandeis University found that only 21% of subsidized units in Eastern Massachusetts are in high opportunity neighborhoods. Final slide, please. With the remaining moderate and low income neighborhoods in Brockton, Lawrence, and Boston, and a few other communities where those folks are able to live. The impact of zoning restrictions on housing supply is further reflected in housing prices. For example, in Brookline, the average price of a single family home was nearly $1.6 million, and the average price of a condominium was $660,000. A median income household in Greater Boston making $98,000 could only afford $230,000 sales price, placing nearly all of Brookline's market rate housing out of reach. While illegal racial steering and discrimination, while illegal racial steering and discrimination by real estate is also still common, in 2005, fair housing testing was conducted in Newton. Evidence of racial discrimination was found in 50% of tests done on rental agents, 13% of tests done on sales agents. These practices perpetuate racial segregation as African-Americans are offered fewer opportunities and are questioned about their ability to pay 
and uh, and are steered toward majority African American neighborhoods and, and communities. To conclude, this afternoon we've explored the history of housing discrimination, describing how African Americans have been systematically disadvantaged with lasting impacts on wealth, access to opportunity, health, and the overall quality of life. Importantly, we've also shown that racial segregation was not accidental. The passage of these, this complex of zoning, banking, and other policies were conscious moral decisions that created glaring racial inequities and continue to be perpetuated in our communities. The good news is that knowing this, we today can make a different set of decisions. The rest of this program will envision an alternative path forward, how all of us here can together build a better Brookline, one in which our policies support racial equity rather than perpetuate inequality. Thank you. And thank you, um, Bob, very much um, for exploring the long history of obstacles faced by African-Americans in obtaining fair access to housing, um, many of which have led us to where we are continuing to have obstacles today. Um, and before we move on to our panel, I just wanted to point out that uh, we have quite an impressive group of uh, attendees at today's uh, forum. Uh, while there are approximately 65 on Zoom, I wanted to let the group and the folks know that there are hundreds also on Facebook and YouTube, which are also uh, broadcasting this, um, this event. So it really reflects, I think, the importance of the uh, subject matter and the interest uh, across town. So um, we'd like now to move on uh, to our panel, uh, which will be moderated by Rashmi D.L. Chand. Rashmi is a professor of law at Northeastern University School of Law, whose research and teaching focuses on property law and economic development and consumer law. Her work has appeared in multiple law review journals, and she's an editor of the law school's online publication, Human Rights in the Global Economy. Again, please consult our website for more background about our distinguished speakers. Um, and over to you, Rashmi. It sounds like Rashmi does not have uh, audio. Um, so uh, while she works on that, I will introduce uh, our first speaker. Oh, you do. Let's, let's, shall we try again? Perfect. It, Over okay, to you, Rashmi. <laughs> Too many mutes for us to deal with sometimes. I apologize. So I'll start again. Thanks, Frank. And the purpose of this panel is to think about the relationship between housing affordability and other key priorities, some of which at times may seem in tension with the goal of housing affordability and with each other. With the aid of experts who have thought deeply about these issues in Brookline, we will discuss the priorities of diversity and inclusion, transportation, economic development, and climate sustainability as they relate to housing affordability. As our panel will discuss, these priorities are interconnected. Achieving each of them requires understanding each of the others. Our explicit hope is that by bringing these priorities into one conversation, we can change that conversation. That we will all leave with concrete and achievable ideas of how different constituencies can work together to build a better book line. And moreover, that we will all leave with ideas about how each of us can contribute in moving forward together. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce a panel of experts who can and will change the conversation. I will introduce them all now in the order of their presentations. And for more extensive information about their impressive work, you can again take a look at their bios on buildingabetterbookline.org. After all five panelists speak, I'll moderate a discussion about the panelists and Bob in which our speakers can respond to questions from the diverse group of stakeholders that we know are in our audience today. When we begin the Q&A portion of this session, we will share information about how to post your questions through the platform on which you are accessing this forum, be it Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube. So now to our speakers. Our first speaker will be Deborah Brown. 
Deborah is a board member of the Brookline Improvement Commission and a town meeting member. She will discuss core issues of diversity and inclusion as they relate to housing affordability. Jennifer Wade is Director of Planning and Community Development for the Town of Brookline and a member of Brookline's advice, Housing Advisory Board. She will discuss the issue of housing affordability in Brookline. Next, we'll hear from Chris Dempsey, who is the Chair of Brookline's Transportation Board and Director of the Coalition Transportation for Massachusetts. He will discuss the connection between transportation and housing affordability. Next, we'll hear from Al Rain, who is a national consultant on mass transit and transit-oriented development and a member of the Economic Development Advisory Board. He will discuss the relationship between housing, transportation, and economic development in Brookline. And finally, we'll hear from Werner Lowy, who is a town meeting member and co-chair of the Select Board's Climate Action Committee. He will discuss the crucial connections between climate sustainability and housing and business density. So with that, Deborah, you have the floor. Deborah, I believe you need to unmute your microphone. Am I unmuted? You're fine now. Okay, great. So the first slide that I think you're looking at now is a picture of George Floyd. And uh, what what George Floyd has has done for us really is he brought he brought forward for us really the idea that race in this nation is is at a breaking point and that especially among our institutions that that life is fragile that for far too many african american and latino men it can be cut short and that thousands of men and many, many more thousands of men and children have been killed or are, are permanently injured. Uh, next slide. Now, what I want to do is rather than talking about diversity and inclusion, I want to talk about racism, because I think that's really what this conversation is about. And I want to use a new definition instead of the typical definition of every individual has done something wrong. And if you look at Ibrahim Kendi's definition that I have in front of you, is is not that you have done something wrong, but rather I, I would rather focus in on what the institutions themselves are doing, how the institutions are letting people down, and that. <clears throat> we need to focus on the fact that individuals are either acting or failing to act and and rather that you are not a racist but that you can't be neutral and the idea there is that you have to be an anti-racist and by that I mean that you have to act. And so the opposite of racist is not, isn't not racist. That is, is it is anti-racist. That one either endorses the idea of a racial hierarchy as a racist or, a ra or racial equity as an anti-racist. Next slide. Now, everybody in here, most people have heard of the Kerner Report. And if you haven't, I encourage you to take a look at it. And most of you have heard of Dr. Martin Luther King and you have heard of I Have a Dream. But one of the things that he's famous for saying is that, you know, this country is on life support. And everybody has heard, most people have heard the statement. 
you know, we have two societies, one black and one white. But one of the things that has gotten said time and time again is that our institutions have allowed these systems to prevail. And that what we have to do is acknowledge that these institutions created in those days ghettos and that white people have allowed this to happen. And that if we go back to that definition of inaction or neutrality in the previous definition of Kendi's, I would argue that it's everybody. You have to be the 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 ant you you have to be engaged. You cannot be that person that idly sits by. And Brookline's no exception. I think that in some ways Brookline is probably the shining example of of a community that, you know, as Mr. Van Meter talked about, that really condoned racism in a way by its inaction. So there's no room for that neutral. And, you know, good people by, by our neutrality, and I think it extends to, in some ways to, to Black and Latino people as well, uh, there's a place for, for our action. So next slide, please. I think you need to go back. So what's changed? I think you know, we had an unexpected trifecta. COVID-19, a failing economy, uh, and Donald Trump. And, and that when you got those, when those three things happened all together, it, 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 has tra it has challenged our neutrality in a way that people, you really can't, people, a lot of young people decided that they couldn't be a neutral, that they had to ask the question, am I going to be an anti-racist? And part of my presentation is to say, you have to make a decision. Are you going to be that anti-racist and challenge our institutions? And many of the institutions that Mr. Van Meter talked about, because these very institutions are what make housing so difficult. Next slide. These are slums. And these are slums sanctions, sanctioned by institutions. Whether it was one of the earliest slave dwellings, whether these are dwellings from the last century. Uh, go to the next slide. Or this, this is current day Brookline housing. Uh, and I don't have outside pictures, but one of the things that, that I would challenge you to do is that when, when I look at some of the housing around here that looks shoddy, wh where is our discussion about budget? When I ask the question about where is the policy discussion and the act and the action, the anti-racist action around policy, where is it? So one, if I ask you the, the question, how much money does Brookline spend on affordable housing? Who could tell me? If I ask you how much money does Brookline contribute to low income housing, what could you tell me? If I asked you as a portion of parks and recreation money, does Brookline contribute to low income areas? What would you tell me? And here's an example. When I drive by low income housing and I look at the shrubbery there, and then I look at that beautiful rose garden and the beautiful park. Why is there such a stark difference? There is a policy decision that we make as a town, as an anti-racist, 
And it just hit me this morning as I was thinking about it. Why can I affirmatively like that park, but not think about the lack of green space for low-income housing? Why is it that I am not actively saying to my representatives, why don't you have more money for state affordable housing? Those are policy issues that we should be asking about. Why is the town of Brookline willing to zero out the, the HAB budget? These are questions that we can ask. So next slide. Thank you. With the police, why are people of color disproportionately stopped or having interaction? And you may say, what the heck does this have to do with housing? You get stopped, you get arrested, you get into a system. Once you get into that system, it becomes extremely difficult for you to then begin to move into a place where you have options, that, that whole financial milieu, network to even begin to buy or rent begins to be cut off. And you could go back to Mr. Van Meter and he will tell you how the institutions begin to shut off for you. And so again, I go back to that definition of being an anti-racist and questioning how the systems operate. And again, you say, well, well, what is the policy issue there? Well, should, should the police be stopping people at such a disproportionate rate? Should we be asking those questions? What are the right questions to be asked? So next slide. And of course, Mr. Van Meter raised a myriad of questions already about the economy, but one that he didn't raise is that when we look at the net worth of African Americans in Boston, it's $8. You can't make this up, $8. And if you don't have wealth, what do you have? When I looked at the poverty data for, for Brookline, and I know I'm zipping through these, through these uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation pretty quickly, but it'll be on the website, $8. What can you do with $8? And that means there are many more people that are in far deeper debt. Now let's look at the poverty data for Brookline. You may say, well, that's Boston, but what about Brooklyn? 34% of African-Americans are living in poverty. 22% of Asians, 17% of Latinos, 8% of whites. There's a policy decision being made here. And not just at the federal level or the state level. What can we do in Brookline to at least begin to ask some tough questions? And again, we have to begin to function as anti-racist. Next slide. So you asked. Well, what is it that we can do? You know, this, this, this is bigger than me. But I, I'm, 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 I'm going to push back a little bit and say this, this, this government has figured out ways to help a whole lot of other folks over the years, and it doesn't necessarily seem to trickle down to folks most in need. And we, we have options. We can do things, but we have to, the anti-racist has to make the policy decision to see that things are done. We have to begin to see our budget, the Brookline budget as a moral document. Where we spend says a great deal about what we believe and how we prioritize things. And housing has to be one of our 
most important issues. It, it is such a basic need. So we have to align our budget with those basic needs. Childcare, job training. We need more anti-racism programming. People need to figure out how they do it. We, we have to invest in community engagement programming. Voting, voting was extremely difficult this time. We need to get progressive people to run for office. We need to educate ourselves. You know, when I looked at uh, the community uh, development block grant money this, this, this go around, a lot of it went to food. A lot of it went to uh, program areas in need, but we need to track it more. We need to make a commitment that even the money that is part of our town budget and not just federal money that comes in actually goes to program areas where there's the greatest need and that we don't hide behind rules that were meant to block people uh, simply saying that it was for nefarious or illegal purposes. If it's for a basic need, then we can use it. So I'm going to conclude my presentation by saying that we can do better. A neutral is not that much different than someone who is exercising a policy that hurts people. So be that anti-racist, be bold, do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Jenny? And Jenny, just Thank remember you so much. to- oh, Did you? Okay, good afternoon. I'm Jenny Raid. I'm a member of the town's housing advisory board since January of 2018. And my task is actually to primarily discuss our community's housing production plan and some of the ways that we can achieve our housing goals in the community. We've heard a great deal from Bob and Deborah. And I think that I have a real opportunity to thread in a number of things that they've talked about into what I'm going to say. The plan that we have was adopted by the select board and the planning board and then approved by the state department of housing and community development in 2016. The plan describes what types of housing we still need and also provides steps for how the town can continue to develop new housing. While the town was developing the plan, hundreds of new housing units were being proposed through what's called mass general law chapter 40 B or the comprehensive permit process. 40 B as some of you may know, is also known as the state's anti-snob anti zoning law, which was created in part for places just like Brookline. Brookline, like other municipalities, has not met the state's statutory minimum number of deed-restricted affordable housing units, which would technically be 2,600 out of 26,000 units, roughly. And we don't have the zoning in place to meet local or regional housing needs specifically by providing allowances in our zoning for multifamily homes. So who we are and what we believe is actually threaded through our zoning as well. As of January, 2020, Brookline has had a little over 2000 deed restricted units now in town. So we, we have been inching towards our goal. More than half of these units were created through our affordable housing regulation, which is known as inclusionary zoning and also a range of state, federal, local, and housing trust resources to create and preserve affordable places for people to live. The majority of our new housing was also created through 40B though, meaning that the state law has played an important role in Brookline to help create a range of new homes that may not have been developed otherwise. But honestly, we can be doing a lot more. And I think that after hearing both from Bob and Deborah, and you're gonna hear from a lot of others, we need to do a lot more. The housing plan explains that more than housing, more housing options are needed to meet the housing demand of seniors, young adults, people with physical and cognitive disabilities, extremely low all the way to moderate income families, as well as housing for what's called the missing middle. The consequence of a lack of affordable options in this community and the continued erosion of housing affordability threatens the attainment of the town's most basic comprehensive plan goal, maintaining the town's commitment to population diversity. We have some important ingredients to build off of here, 
We've got a demand for housing, clear community and regional need for housing, local resources, an engaged group of community members. Well, what about our zoning? The housing production plan pinpointed four sets of strategies for the town to advance to create and preserve housing. It included regulatory, resource allocation, education and advocacy, and local planning and policy. The combined impact of these strategies would be enormous, and we can only wish for that. According to the plan, the biggest impact, though, was moving the needle and creating more homes by dramatically improving a regulatory environment. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because it sounds a lot like what Deborah was talking about in part, one of many things that she mentioned, which is an institutional framework. So what would an anti-racist zoning bylaw look like? I think it's important for us to ask that question right now in particular. Right now, according to the plan, we currently don't allow multifamily housing or mixed use development in our commercial areas by right. We don't have the zoning in place to allow a large enough building to include affordable housing by right. We can develop a single family home, a two family home, a three family home by right, but nothing to include affordable housing. But Brookline can strategically and creatively address the need for more affordable homes through st strategic public private partnerships working with larger institutions and this rezoning that I'm talking about. We have a lot of examples of these successes. So many are happening right now. If you just drive around, you can see a number of new communities being built as a result of those local par partnerships and initiatives. But why do we want to keep strategically and creatively working around poor regulatory processes and rules to create new housing? Right now, it's particularly important to pause and look introspectively as a community who do we want to be? Well, the HCP suggests that we are trending toward becoming a community with the haves, have mores, and public housing. Welcoming housing in Brookline requires a dedicated shift in the way we are thinking and what we are doing. We can recognize and commit to our community values for increasing socioeconomic and racial diversity by increasing housing availability and affordability in Brookline. And we can turn the page on a divided and unequal Brookline and region. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. And now, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Chris Dempsey with the Brookline Transportation Board. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 6 and a resident of Brookline Village. And as my slides get pulled up, I'll share with you that uh, there's a lot at the intersection of transportation and housing way more than we can discuss in the three minutes that I have to share with you today. And so I wanted to focus on one issue in particular, and that's on the next slide. I'm hoping to make the case that our outdated parking minimums, which are part of the old zoning code that Jenny just described, lead to three things that prevent more affordable housing in Brookline. One is that they increase the cost of home construction, the second is that they increase household costs for low-income residents, whether they're owners or renters. And the third is that they diminish the tax base potential of Brookline, which means we have fewer dollars to allocate to affordable housing, to low-income housing, or any other public service need. So even if you're following this webinar today and affordable housing is not your issue, it's not something you care about, any other issue you care about in town that requires funding touches on this question of zoning and parking minimums. Next slide, please. So on the cost of construction, our zoning code throughout town um, requires that 100% of new units have parking associated with them. And that can be either done by surface parking, which has enormous opportunity costs. Every time we pave a parking space, it means we have less space for trees or for gardens or for a front porch. Or it can happen through structured parking and underground parking, both of which have a minimum cost of 25k per spot and often come to $100,000 per spot. In the case of the parking that was proposed under Cypress Field, that was $100,000 of town funds per spot for that project. That significantly increases the cost of construction of housing, which means higher housing costs which means less affordable housing for everyone. Let's talk about the household impact on the next slide. I ran the numbers on Edmunds.com on owning a 2014 Honda Civic, hardly a luxury vehicle, hardly top of the line, late model 
This is a 2014 Honda Civic, and even that costs $443 per month for a resident that might want to own this vehicle. The assumption in our zoning code that people are going to own vehicles means that we are also assuming they are able to pay $443 for their transportation on top of whatever they're paying for housing. Compare that to an MBTA pass, which costs under $100 a month for the subway and bus link pass. Now you might be saying, well, not everyone can get to work or not everyone can get where they're going in public transit. And of course that's true, but the, the reverse is also true, which is not everyone needs a car. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all that 100% of our zoning code says that, that new housing must have a parking spot. Next slide. Let's move to this discussion of the costs of, uh, of these decisions and this zoning for the town's financial budget. Here's the Walgreens at the intersection of Aspenwall and Harvard. And this was actually built according to our zoning code where we required dozens of parking spaces to be associated with that Walgreens. And if you look at this site and you look at the next slide, you'll see that actually two thirds of the value of this site or the land on this site is just pavement. There's no value to it whatsoever other than that it's parking for the 32% that's actually built up as a building. Next slide. Compare that to this old building that's over 100 years old, uh, a, a few blocks up Harvard Street, wh which is the home to the Brookline Lock Company and the Boabomb Studio. This is a site, if you look at the next slide, where there's actually no space dedicated to parking whatsoever. 100% of the lot is dedicated to valuable building that can be used by human beings to do whatever they're going to do, shop or, or be in the studio or even live. The parking is instead a shared community resource. It's the street parking that we all have. Next slide. And when you compare these two buildings, you actually see that despite thinking that the newer Walgreens building, which has uh, such a high profile brand name associated with it, actually produces far less tax revenue on a per square foot basis. In fact, this old Brookline Lock Company, humble building, produces 5.6 times as much tax revenue for the town of Brookline per square foot as the Walgreen does. And yet our zoning code requires buildings like Walgreens and it prohibits buildings like the Brookline Lock Company, despite the fact that again, they are so much more valuable. And again, what's true of our commercial zoning is also true of our housing zoning. So just on my final slide here, this is one of my favorite buildings in all of Brookline. This is the Magnolia Smokehouse building in Brookline Village. It was built in 1884. It's actually across the street from where I live. And when you look at our assessor's database and you compare the tax revenue that's brought in per square foot, this building over 120 years old, 130 years old now, is the fifth most valuable building in all of Brookline. It is hugely efficient because it has first floor retail and that it has three levels of housing above it. And if we are going to build affordable housing and we're going to build buildings that allow us to support robust public services, schools, and everything else that we use our dollars, our public dollars for in the Brookline budget, we need zoning codes that have many more, allow many more buildings like this elegant, gorgeous building that you have in Brookline Village. There is no reason why Harvard Street should not be lined with buildings like these and, and not have Walgreens, not have auto-focused businesses, but have, have buildings like these instead. If we did that, we would have more affordable housing, more accessible housing, and we would have stronger tax revenue for the town. Thanks very much, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Chris. And now, Al. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Al Rain, and uh, I'm on the Economic Development Advisory Board. And like Chris, I live in Brookline Village. Uh, my overarching point is that economic development and housing affordability are not competing goals, but they're complementary and, in fact, integrally related to one another. And together, they're very important to Brookline. For one thing, Brookline needs more revenue, for the reasons that Chris said, from sources other than single and two-family homes, and that means both commercial development and multifamily housing, and meaningful revenue growth will require enough density to drive efficient use of scarce land. Now, walkable, affordable multifamily housing is essential 
for economic development, especially in and around uh, transit-oriented commercial districts, which are mixed use, walkable, reasonably dense. And in terms of urban form, there's nothing new about this, notwithstanding our zoning, as Jen mentioned, this is more or less what we've done for a hundred years uh, in the northern part of the town. And this is a very important synergy. These mixed use commercial districts, they wrap a concentration of housing around stores, offices, restaurants, services, and critically, the tea. Now for businesses, having workers and customers within walking distance or within a hop on hop off bus or green line ride is very important for obvious reasons. And for residents, this synergistic combination means that they have convenient access to jobs, schools, services, and fun, the things that attract people to Brookline in the first place. Now, uh, the reverse is true as well. Mixed use transit oriented development is essential for housing affordability. First of all, there's kind of an obligation. Uh, if commerce in Brookline needs dense multifamily housing for the reasons that I just talked about, then there's an obligation to make a meaningful share of that housing affordable, uh, both through uh, affordability programs, uh, deed restricted affordable housing, as Jen was describing, and through the economics of density and geography. Economics of density, multifamily housing modulates prices through the working of supply and demand. It's not perfect. Expensive housing at expensive towns will be expensive, but I think we all understand the workings of supply and demand. Secondly, Housing near transit modulates the overall household cost of living, exactly as Chris was describing. Uh, in, in, in the business, we use something called the Housing Plus Transportation Affordability Index uh, to simply measure the combined costs of those two things, the two big expenses for most households. And living near transit and dense walkable multifamily housing means a lot more people can live near transit, enables people to at least somewhat offset the cost of housing through the much, much lower cost of commuting. And certainly part and parcel of that uh, is I completely endorse Chris's point about parking. In short, mixed use, walkable, transit oriented development with multifamily housing and the density of a robust commercial district is how Brookline can grow equitably and sustainably in the future. But we need to do that with an intentional focus on housing affordability. Thank you. Thank you, Al. And finally, but not least, Warner. Warner, I think you need to unmute yourself. I'm muted. Hello, I'm Warner Lowy. I'm on the Select Board's Climate Action Committee. Uh, the big picture in terms of the climate crisis is obvious. Global warming is a worldwide crisis, but every community has an obligation to address it. Uh, for example, Worldwide and nationwide, one of the worst consequences of climate change is that families lose their houses uh, because of flooding. Poor people and people of color are the most at risk because disproportionately they live in low-lying areas. Well, we could be tempted in, to relax perhaps in Brookline. And after all, we're not New Orleans, we're not Miami, or even Boston, or even Lynn or Revere, right? Uh, but did you know that the low-income housing uh, on Village Way, right behind Pearl Street, it's only 10 feet above sea level. But, but that's not really the point. The, the point really isn't how much we'll be affected, uh, uh, or particularly as individuals, um, but or how much we have contributed to the problem as individuals. It's much more like the Black Lives Matters movement. We, we all need to take responsibility uh, to bring about systemic change. Uh, for example, one of the greatest causes of CO2 emissions is car travel, commuting and local driving in particular. Uh, certainly, we should try to reduce our driving as individuals, uh, but uh, it's more important to focus on systemic issues. Why do people drive? Well, for one thing, um, for one thing, lack of affordable housing forces, forces working class people in particular to move farther from their jobs and away from public transit. So spread out suburban housing development increases environmental impacts. Denser housing is cheaper to build and has less environmental impact. So building more densely in places like Brookline both makes housing more affordable and it addresses climate change. The biggest new 
challenge effect, affecting uh, or in, in addressing climate change is the electrification of buildings. Uh, subsidized affordable housing is generally built to very high standards and is leading the way on electrification, in part because it saves money. It often reduces capital costs and, and certainly reduces operating costs for any well-designed building. Uh, a perfect example actually is the Brookline Housing Authority. Uh, just two days ago, Patrick Dover announced that the new Colonel Floyd development will have electric heating and cooking. So just as the schools have committed to making the new municipal school fossil fuel free, we're going to have uh, electrification of, of public housing. So, so that those, both of those things are things I hope people will support the uh, Colonel Floyd development and also the Driscoll School, which includes supporting the zoning change for the well tower development on Fisher Hill. Um, but something else to, to bear in mind uh, is that energy efficiency uh, increases affordability across the board for people of any income bracket. Um, and that will continue as the cost of renewables is likely to continue to fall. But at the same time, over the next decades, gas customers are going to see their rates increase. One reason is that they're going to have to pay for, for about $8 billion of, uh, to upgrade the gas infrastructure. So we, what we don't want is for only well-to-do people to have new electric technology, leaving poor people as the last group to pay high rates to maintain an antiquated gas system. Uh, low income and vulnerable households who don't live in subsidized housing actually have the fewest housing options. Cheaper, older, low quality housing tends to waste energy and higher utility bills affect low income families uh, more than anyone else. Therefore, energy efficiency measures help them more. Uh, that's one reason that the Mass Clean Energy Center has a number of programs uh, to help the transition to full electrification of housing. Um, and a number of those are specifically targeted towards low and moderate income people. For instance, uh, at the end of, 19, uh, end of 2019, the Mass CEC announced awards to 20, uh, not 20, but to eight uh, new energy efficiency affordable housing developments. Uh, which constituted uh, 540 affordable housing units that are actually built to passive house standards. But these programs not only help low-income families, but they're also really an important opportunity to bring funds into Brookline to make the connection between affordable housing and climate change. Uh, I think my time is pretty much up, so let me end, end with this. Um, throughout my adult life, I personally have spent roughly equal amounts of my energy on affordable housing and on environmental issues. But even if you've just been involved in one of those issues or just been watching it, uh, you've probably noticed the same thing. It's almost, it's almost a tradition. Um, it's still very often the case that people who oppose afford affordable housing use environmental issues as a stalking horse. And they try to drive a wedge between environmentalists and affordable housing advocates. So uh, for me, if there's one thing that I hope that comes out of today's forum, it's a new resolve to work together to build the kind of housing that's good for people, that's good for the economy, and that's good for the environment. Thank you. Thanks so much, Warner, and to all our panelists. So uh, it's time for us to have a conversation. I know uh, certainly I have so much food for thought now as a result of these presentations all packed into a, a, a short period of time. Uh, and so let's quickly review the ways in which you can share, post your questions. Uh, do we have that slide available? While we wait for it, let me just at least start by reminding you that um, on Zoom, of course, you can use the Q&A or chat function to share questions. Uh, here's the slide. Um, you can post your questions uh, uh, at the link at the bottom of the Zoom, Zoom screen, screen. And then for Facebook and YouTube users, you can use the comment section to share uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, and so we'll look forward to receiving questions as they come in. But let me, uh, let me at least start us off in this conversation uh, with a question that sort of heart, harkens back to the title of this um, webinar, which is that we're talking about all of these issues in the age of COVID. Uh, 
um, and COVID-19. And it's not the only crisis that we currently have uh, sort of surrounding us and looming in our lives. We have the problem of the pandemic, of course, but we also have, uh, as Deborah described, issues uh, and crises as a result of structural racism uh, that, that continue uh, to strike us week by week. We have um, the climate crisis. We have, uh, you know, resultant financial crises. And you all, I think, have presented an an excellent case that we need to continue to focus on affordable housing in connection with these sets of issues. But perhaps one question uh, that ought to be addressed, and then I would be grateful for your addressing, is what is the urgency for focusing, you know, you're, you're, you're telling us that we need to really think about ways in which to act immediately and effectively. Why focus on affordable housing now, this summer, starting immediately, um, even as we feel the urgency of these other crises upon us. So if, if any or all of you could speak to that as we continue to collect uh, questions, that would be wonderful. You may just have to unmute yourselves to do it uh, because it's not going to be completely clear. Um, this is Bob. Oh, Bob, thank you. I would argue that addressing structural racism for people that live in suburban communities means fundamentally addressing housing segregation and housing discrimination. That that's one of the issues that can be addressed at the local community level by changing policies on zoning and promoting more inclusive housing policies. That's something that people in Brookline and other suburban communities can do that directly addresses the causes of racial justice and racial inequality in this country. And that's a reason to take this up now. Thanks, Al, and then Chris. Yeah, I, I would add to what Bob said that, you know, a day doesn't go by that you don't read two or three stories around the country or columns about you know, as a result of the pandemic, X will never be the same. And one of the X's I'm getting tired of reading about is that people will never choose to live in cities again, or against towns like Brookline, or people will never choose to ride transit again. And if those things are true, then uh, then we're doomed from a climate standpoint and and, and from a from a societal standpoint. Uh, but we're at a moment in time when people are going to perhaps seize on, on, on those, those prognostications as an affirmative reason not to do anything. And I think it's very important to be on the other side of that, not only from an affordability and a racial equity standpoint, but it's, you know, we're going to, we're going to hear too much uh, over the next several months of why the way that a lot of us choose to live uh, in, 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 in socially diverse places with lots, lots of things to do and transit and our feet to get around on is no longer a good idea. And there's never been a better time uh, to assert that it is. And part of that is continuing to do our work on housing affordability. This, this is Chris. I agree with everything that Bob and Al just said. And I would only add that I do think some of the things we're calling for will take some time to come to fruition. You know, changing zoning and then having new buildings built does not happen overnight. But I'd go back to the long used proverb um, of the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time to plant a tree is today. And if we make these changes now, the benefits of the shade that that tree is going to provide will truly last generations in Brookline in the same way that that building I ended my presentation with has now lasted four or five generations in Brookline and provided housing and provided retail space to those generations. And so let's do that now to build a long and productive and prosperous and more fair future. Deborah? Oh. Deborah, did you have something to add at this moment? Just need to unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, for a lot of, for some people in Brookline, housing is already at a crisis stage. 
you know, we, we have young families that, that are actually moving around every year or so as the rents go up. So it's, while the relief won't come soon enough, they need something now. And so we can plant some trees now for the long view, but we also need to plant some shrubs today to get some immediate relief. And some of that, when I was talking about with the policy of, of, of helping Brookline Housing Authority uh, make some improvements there, I think we can do that fairly quickly. I, I, I think that as a town, we, we need to create more partnerships with Brookline Housing Authority. Uh, I think that we need to think about how we can help. Uh, and I don't mean poor families. I mean those families that are making, you know, seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year with with their rents. And I, I think we need to get creative about it. But there are people in Brookline now, young families that are hurting, and what we're doing is is not reaching them. So for some people, it is a crisis. And I, I don't think that we can talk about the, 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 long, the long run for them because they don't have that luxury. Thank you. What? I, I liked uh, what Bob said initially very much. It seems to me one thing we're up against in the climate movement is that uh, that often people really don't see climate change. They're seeing it a little more now, but it's, it's a little bit hidden. And certainly uh, until recently, one of the problems with racism is that white people often don't see it. Um, and therefore, one of the important reasons to work on affordable housing is it's very concrete. And perhaps even uh, as Al was alluding to, it, it forces people to to actually get into a debate or a, uh, uh, or it's, they're, they're really, every time housing is proposed, people see it in a very concrete way and the discussion happens. And it's an opportunity to move the discussion on all these issues forward. And Jenny. Jenny. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, first of all, I agree with all of the, my fellow panelists about everything that they've already said, but I'll just add that um, you know, there are people that are currently hurting in Brookline right now. That, that's something to address right away. Um, in terms of the town's commitment to doing this, this has always been a priority issue for the town of Brookline. It's about actually making it happen. It's taking it to the next step and, or series of steps. And, and that's, I think, what we're actually talking about is how do we get from we say we're committed to this to actually starting to do things very proactively and affirmatively to make them actually happen. And part of that is financial. Making sure that we have money for our housing trust and affordable housing is part of that picture, um, as is just making sure that the housing safety net is in place. We're very lucky to be able to work with the Brookline Foundation on our safety net funds, but even more could be done. Um, you know, and I think it's just about giving people more choices, which clearly we need to do, as illustrated by things that Deborah has said about people needing to move or moving around within the community. People are not properly housed, and we need to be addressing that. Um, and in terms of why now, as opposed to any other time, I do think that there's this, that we are at this very interesting moment in time. I don't know why it is... Um, you know, why we need to say that affordable housing is the only issue. We're really trying to talk about all of the issues coming together comprehensively in town and really trying to make that work requires us to think outside of just thinking about creating new housing. It's creating the place we want Brookline to be, which is what we say is welcoming and diverse. And if we want to do that, we need to be taking those steps right now. Great, thank you. And that's actually the ideal segue, perhaps. You may have read my mind, Jenny, to a pair of questions that have come in. I'm going to share both of them um, just so you see what's, what's, uh, what lies ahead for you, panelists, as well as Bob, um, and, then, and then prioritize one first for you. Uh, what we're getting from uh, our audience uh, clearly is, I think, a sense of investment here, but also a request to the panelists to talk to us about prioritizing action 
Um, so there are a pair of questions that we've received. There's a pair of questions here. One is, what's the, what are the three most effective things that a non-office holding Brookline resident can do to advance affordable housing in our town? That's a question that came in from uh, one of the Facebook viewers. And then the, the, the other side of this is, we know we have town meeting members who are in our audience as well. And one of them has asked, uh, you know, there's a town meeting coming up soon this month, and then again in November. What would you prioritize by way of actions that town meeting members can take on the issue of affordable housing? So let's start with the non-office holding uh, Brookline residents, again, of whom there are quite a few in the audience. Uh, and, and panelists, if you could respond to that uh, question, uh, that would be wonderful. Let me repeat the question. What are the three things you would prioritize for non-office holding uh, Brookline residents to do? Al. I'll suggest one, uh, be, be a YIMBY to use uh, a, a, new, a new acronym, a, a yes in my backyard person. Make it clear to the people that represent you in town meeting and to the members of the select board and others that you care about this and that you're not somebody who, who votes and will be unhappy if affordable housing proposals are on the table and you won't be unhappy and you won't hold it against the town meeting member if they support that in zoning or financial assistance. And in fact, you'll be unhappy if they don't. That's what you can do. And I would follow that up with saying, be as specific as you can. There are places, uh, I live near Washington Square, uh, Washington Square, St. Mary's, uh, for instance, are two places. There are a couple others in Brookline that have uh, a lot of, one story buildings, uh, 50 years from now, those are going to look different. The question is whether people now can start getting hold, grabbing hold of the planning process and direct the, how that development happens rather than just letting it happen. So one thing that people that live in neighborhoods like that can do is start talking to their neighbors and as Al is saying, talking to people, their town meeting members and other representatives uh, about how those neighborhoods should be developed. Thank you. This is Chris, I'll just jump in and um, and note a really great grassroots organization that has formed in the last few years called the Brookline for Everyone. And you can learn about them at brooklineforeveryone.com. A set of our neighbors and some fellow town meeting members who feel that Brookline does need to have proper growth and needs to have the density that a Brookline Village or a Coolidge Corner have with mixed use uh, retail and affordable homes. Uh, and they've been great advocates for, uh, for those types of policies um, and for supporting town meeting member candidates and select board candidates that support those policies. So that's a great website to visit and sign up for their emails and attend their events and support what they're doing. Thanks. I'm pausing just to see if any other of, of our panelists, Deborah. Yeah. Uh, so on the most effective things that uh, residents can do, I, you know, I think they should start telling select board, I'm going to go back to my initial presentation that they need to think about being an anti-racist, that they need to get active, and that they need to pull up that 2016 housing production report. And they need to ask for a new housing report because one, it's not aggressive enough. If we're serious about affordable housing, we cannot rely on 40 Bs. 40 Bs are not going to do it. If we really want to get some affordable housing, we're going to have to do a little more. Two, I think people need to tell select board that they're not happy with the way that we're addressing affordable housing. Three, we need to get more people engaged around affordable housing. And that means showing up at the HAB meetings, housing advisory board, and telling people, if you have a particular interest, tell them what you want to see. 
Tell them how you want the have money spent. But you, you are going to have to be specific. So those are the three things that I would suggest. Revisit that 2016 report. Tell select board that you want to see more action around affordable housing and go to the HAB meetings and tell them how you want their funds spent. As per town meeting, I would suggest that you say that you want them to pass the affordable housing resolution. I would say that you want uh, town meeting members to vote to have the HAB money restore, restored to the budget at a minimum and that uh, I'm on the fence, but grudgingly vote for Newberry College, that the town fund Newberry College and support uh, funding uh, the Colonel Floyd development. That's a hundred uh, new low income units that I don't believe would otherwise happen. So th those would be my three things uh, on the low income and affordable housing side. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, first of all, yes, we, we will need to update that housing production plan anyway. It actually is only good for five years, so it expires in 2021. So thank you, Deborah, for that plug on that one. We, we definitely need to update it, and it does need to be more aggressive and look beyond once we achieve a certain statewide, you know, slightly trivial goal. Um, but I, I want to add on to everything that people have already said by just uh, emphasizing a couple things. One is um, being a YIMBY means advocating for changes, which means new zoning, new opportunities, and also advocating for current proposals sometimes. But when you're doing that, you also need to call out as an anti-racist language that is biased, that we hear at lots of meetings. You need to do that too. To be part of this means correcting when we talk about being welcoming, but then we say we don't want children, we don't want certain things, and we keep on adding to a list of all the things that we don't want that we forget what we actually wanted. We need to stop doing that. Um, also to, to Deborah's point, we do need town meeting members to reinstate the free cash contribution to our housing trust this year, which has historically been contributed year over year. We can't have that be forgotten. Uh, the trust money is very important to a lot of initiatives. And of course, the HAB welcomes much input on how we allocate and appropriate the money. Um, and then the other thing I would say is back to the comment I made about the zoning bylaw, is it anti-racist? Let's have town meeting help us and others help us to figure out if it's anti-racist. Are we doing the right thing or are we not? Um, or what are we actually saying we want to build based on what our zoning bylaw says? Thank you. We have a number of questions that have come in about uh, zoning. So once again, a good segue. And there, are, uh, uh, so let's stay with the zoning issue for a bit. And there are a pair of questions that I'm going to ask together because they really are so complimentary. Um, first of all, um, one question, question, one person asks is, if one looks at Brookline zoning map, uh, it looks like the majority is given over to single family residential. So the question is, is this the right kind of zoning map for affordable housing? Um, and a related but more specific question is a question referring back to Chris's uh, discussion of the Magnolias building. What would be the first two steps that we would need to take to change our zoning so we could have more buildings like Magnolias where there's commercial on the first floor and housing above? So. Let me throw both of those out for the panelists to, to, to discuss with us. I'll just jump okay. in quickly on the parking question. And I think Jenny also already referenced the question of commercial districts and mixed use development there. So I may throw it back to her for that piece of it. Um, but uh, our parking minimums are in our zoning code today. There have been some changes over the last few years that have made them slightly better, but they're still really out of whack and probably shouldn't exist at all. There has been a, an effort to bring that back before town meeting this year. It's going to be pushed to a future town meeting because of our need to meet virtually 
later this month. And so um, it won't be before us. But again, coming out of that group recline for, for everyone that I mentioned, um, that should be before a future town meeting and we need town meeting members to support that. It requires a two thirds vote as any zoning change does. And so we, we need to have strong support from town meeting and uh, I hope that that does happen. That will be one step. And then let me turn it over to Jenny to talk about the, the mixed use nature or prohibition in a lot of our commercial districts. Yep, thank you, Chris. Um, so first I wanna say we have 32 zoning districts, um, including overlay districts in Brookline. <laughs> so it, it's, it's a little busy, um, but it isn't, it, it, it probably does not reflect everything that we want the town to be. And that, that's part of looking at the zoning bylaw also meant the zoning map. Um, when we did the housing production plan, we actually created a site um, suitability analysis, which uh, showcased certain commercial corridors where we thought these would be good areas to encourage multifamily or mixed use development. But in reality, um, what you can currently do in those locations is far less than you might possibly ever imagine, uh, which means that you can't get the right um, units per acre, you, uh, the floor to area ratio. I mean, these are all planning terminology, but think of a lot and think of what you might be able to build on it. And it, it just keeps shrink, uh, shrinking with every single requirement that you layer on that's that sort of layering piece that we were talking about earlier in zoning um, or just in, in rules and regulations. It's a, it has a one, one rule layered upon another in, in development means that you end up building very little potentially and, and even less because it is not by right development. So it goes through a discretionary permitting process. So it's not expedited in any manner. Um, and has to conform to a myriad of requirements. Um, and that includes along our commercial corridors. Um, other things that were mentioned in the housing production plan, including amending zoning to provide more incentives, um, as in more zoning overlay districts, potentially more diversity of housing types, uh, which included accessory dwelling units, for example, which was adopted last year by town meeting, um, and a number of other ideas as well, which I, I'm glad to go into. Another thing we should do while we are doing all that uh, change to the uh, zoning bylaw, which is absolutely essential, but is a long-term task, is uh, is get more comfortable with Chapter 40B. I mean, very soon we're going to have uh, reached the 10% the threshold, and that is a real opportunity that there are a number of communities around the state, uh, Cambridge and Amherst and, and a number of communities that have used friendly 40Bs uh, to great effect to build affordable housing. So particularly in a community like ours where, where uh, uh, it's, it's very hard to locate sites, uh, people I think should also not only be planning but thinking on a project by project basis, looking at particular sites and saying, uh, is this really the best use of the current site? And what can we do that would be better there and again, better in all ways, not just building as dense as you can, but thinking about building things, little things like the, the, the Webster Street Hotel has a public park behind it. And the reason for that was not because of zoning, because that, that hotel, which I think has been very successful and has a shared street out front, uh, it's, been, it's a very successful development because, because it was done outside of the zoning system. It was done by town meeting rezoning that. And we can do the same thing with, with friendly chapter 40 Bs, little things that have uh, mixed use of housing and have open space uh, and, and fit into the neighborhoods that, that they're in. We only have another minute or two. Oh, Al, uh, do you want, want to respond to this question also? Uh, I do and I'll respond quickly without being specific and starting the revolution by saying what I mean by height. Uh, zoning debates, always come down to people's fear of height and they may really be afraid of height or they may be pretending to be afraid of height but when we look at zoning we'll have we're going to want to look i think not only at making vertical mixed use uh, like the magnolia smokehouse building uh, something easily done by right uh, but not balking uh, at uh, you know too too reflexively uh, at heights uh, you know not downtown Boston Heights, uh, but it, but it, but in more height uh, than uh, than than we might be used to seeing. And a lot of buildings in Brookline that people look at and say, "That's great. It looks like it's 
been here for 100 years or it has been here for 100 years is like four stories tall. We ought to be able to do that without much trouble, but in some places we ought to do more. Thanks so much. So we have had so many questions come in and uh, clearly indicative of so much interest and investment in this issue. Uh, we have to start wrapping things up now. Uh, and I, I want to mention to those of you whose questions weren't answered that uh, there's a commitment being made on the part of the organizers of this webinar to um, post both the questions and as, and as many answers as they can share with you on um, our website uh, in the next week or two. There is one question that uh, is has been raised that uh, that was referenced partly in one of the responses that Chris gave, which is what would it take uh, to change the requirement that two-thirds of the town meeting members uh, have to vote in favor of a zoning change. Uh, there has been legislation introduced um, to reduce that that uh, percentage to, to, to a majority, a simple majority. And I'm not sure if there's a slide ready quite yet. Uh, we're working quickly here. Uh, but uh, we do have at least some answers to that question. Let me pause and see if the panelists can respond at all to the question of just how to move things forward by changing that supermajority requirement, first of all. This is Chris, I'll jump in. Chris. Yeah, so, so yeah. that's a state law and that will require change at the state legislative level. And so the simplest thing to do there is to contact all of our representatives and senators and uh, Senator Cream and our, and our representatives and say that we want that changed. Um, and that's actually part of the governor's housing bill, which the governor has been pushing for about two years now that the legislature has been reluctant to act, to act on. My understanding is all of the representatives uh, who represent Brookline are supportive of that bill, um, but I can't say that I actually know that exactly. And so um, more of a push there, more of them hearing from all of us that that's a priority and that it needs to get passed will help change that and make it easier for us to make these changes in the zoning code. Great, thank you so much, Chris. All right, we are going to have to start wrapping things up here. So I want to thank the panelists as well as Bob Van Meter once more for your uh, thought-inspiring, thought-provoking presentations. And now, uh, Frank, I'd like to turn it back to you to close us out. Great, thanks, Rashmi. And thank you to all of our speakers who've done a terrific job exploring the many interrelated factors that influence housing affordability. It's really beautiful outside, so I will be quick in closing. Um, but I do want to just, uh, with some final thoughts, uh, note that it's really clear that all kinds of legacy systems have constrained access to housing, and that there's a clear call uh, for zoning and policy changes from all of the constituent groups you've heard from today. After hearing our outstanding panel, I hope you have been inspired to consider some of the many ways we can move forward together with more comprehensive and coordinated actions that look beyond housing to include the other critical elements that define life in Brookline. We've all seen how the multiple crises of the coronavirus, a failing economy, and police violence exposes racial disparities. And as community members, search for an effective response, housing affordability has emerged as an essential part of the solution. One thing that is clear based on the history of housing access and availability and the current challenges and opportunities that the panel has illuminated, what is clear is that we have choices ahead of us about how we want to live and what we want to build and, what we ha and that we have <clears throat> an opportunity to make positive changes across our community as we start to wake up from a forced hibernation. Economic and, social forces is, economic and social forces are driving new ways of thinking about what we value and what's sustainable for people and for the planet. And our livable space broadly understood reflects those choices. In our next forum, which will take place on Sunday, July 26 at 1 p.m., we'll consider some of the choices that other communities have made to increase the housing supply at low and middle income levels. This online forum called Elements of Successful Strategies will address both the technical aspects behind best practice and the local community engagement needed to ensure successful outcomes.
And looking even further ahead, in case you haven't been to our website, buildingabetterbrookline.org, we're planning to host a third forum in the fall that will build on the previous forums and consider the future of housing affordability in Brookline. This forum will offer a vision that incorporates the five interdependent constituencies we've heard from today and probably more, and then consider different ways to move forward with concrete action steps. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and once again, uh, the interest here in housing affordability reflects how important and timely we all think this discussion is. We look forward to meeting again later this summer. Thanks.